Today's top story could have very easily been a standalone episode. It's one of the more uniquely terrifying things I've ever come across. But before we get into today's stories, if you're a fan of the strange, dark, and mysterious delivered in story format, then you've come to the right channel because that's all we do and we upload three, four, even five times every week. So if that's of interest to you, please invite the like button to your birthday party, but then give them the wrong address. Also, please subscribe to this channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of our weekly uploads. All right, let's get into today's stories. In 2015, 32-year-old Henry McCabe was living just outside of Minneapolis, Minnesota with his wife, Kareen, and their two daughters. Henry was a Liberian immigrant who worked as an auditor for the Minnesota Department of Revenue. On September 6th, Henry's wife and his two kids head out to California to visit with some family, leaving Henry alone. Henry decides, you know what? I don't get a chance to go out very much because I'm working all the time, I got family, and so tonight I'm gonna cut loose. So he calls his two very close friends and they decide to go to a nightclub. They get to the nightclub and Henry very quickly starts drinking a lot of alcohol and lots of people that were at the club would say he seemed pretty intoxicated. The trio would stay at the nightclub till about two in the morning and then when they left, Henry, who had driven there and met his two friends at the club, was about to drive himself home when one of his two friends said, wait a minute, you can't be driving. We'll give you a ride home. So Henry gets in the car with them and they start driving to Henry's house. But when they're about halfway there, Henry tells them to go to a very specific gas station. He said he wanted to get food and a drink, but the gas station he was trying to go to was two miles in the opposite direction away from his house. And his friends are telling him, you know, we can bring you to a closer gas station. We can bring you somewhere that's more convenient. But Henry was really aggressive and very adamant that that was the gas station he wanted to go to. And in fact, I don't even want you to wait for me. I want you to drop me off. I will get whatever I want and then I'll walk home. And his friends put up a bit of a fight, but ultimately they relented and they drove him to this gas station. They dropped him off. They watched him go inside and they turned around and they left. At 2.28 in the morning, Henry's wife, Kareen, looked at her phone and she saw she had a missed call and a voicemail from Henry. She opens it up and she listens to it and she's horrified at what she hears. On the voicemail, Henry sounds incredibly distressed. He's yelling that he's been shot and it sounds like he's in pain. And then in the background, you hear this really intense growling sound. It's pretty easy to distinguish. And then Henry starts screaming about whatever is growling at him. And then Henry yells out, stop it, before the phone cuts out. The full two minute voicemail has never been released by police. This is what was made publicly available. <laughs> right after Kareen listens to this voicemail, she tries calling Henry and it goes straight to voicemail. So she tries calling Henry's brother. She can't get in touch with him, so she calls the police. So the police go out looking for Henry. They go to his house, he's not there. And then they track down the two friends he was with who immediately tell them, hey, we dropped him off at this gas station. We know it's a little bit strange that he wanted to go here, but he was insistent. And so that's where we dropped him off. So the police look around the gas station. They talk to the attendant. They talk to some people that were there and no one knows where Henry is. So at this point, the police pull Henry's phone records and they can see he placed a call to his wife at about 2 23 in the morning, but they can't determine where he was when he placed this call. The assumption is he was at the gas station. Then just a few minutes later, he places another call to his brother and his brother would report to police that all Henry was doing on the call was just sobbing. And again, with that phone call, the police were not able to pinpoint where Henry was when he made the call. And following that call to his brother, he turned his phone off. Several hours later, his phone would turn back on and it would ping about four miles away from this gas station and then his phone would turn off again. And the police are thinking, you know what? It's a grown man. He went out drinking with his friends. He's bound to sober up and turn up at some point. Let's just wait this one out. But Henry didn't turn up and days turned into weeks, turned into months, and no one's heard from Henry. No one has any idea where he is. On November 2nd, so two months after Henry goes missing, his body is found in a lake up near the area where his cell phone had last pinged. This area is a very difficult area to access. There's no public access to this lake, and the lake sits in a very heavily forested area. Even though Henry had told his wife on the voicemail that he had been shot, and it sounds like he's being attacked on the voicemail, 
there were no injuries to his body. And so even though the case was bizarre to everybody involved, they ruled it an accidental drowning. Some say he took his own life because he had recently bounced a check for his rent and he had a bad performance review at work. Others say he was just intoxicated and stumbled into the lake and drowned. But neither of those explanations account for the very obvious growling and strange sounds that we heard on his voicemail. And so to this day, Henry McCabe's death remains a mystery. 911 dispatchers hear a lot of interesting stories coming from the other end of the phone. But one group of dispatchers out of Reno, Nevada, may win the award for the creepiest 911 calls ever received. When the details of these calls they got were put online, the internet went crazy. Here is their story. There was this old couple that lived about 20 miles east of Reno, Nevada. In 2010, the husband dies, leaving the wife all alone in this house. Shortly after his passing, she began calling 911 two, three times a week, requesting things like, can you please put some water on to boil? Hey, can you change the thermostat? It was clear she was showing signs of dementia and the dispatchers were respectful of her and gently told her that this is 911, you can only call if it's an emergency. And at some point the woman would understand her mistake and she would say sorry and she would hang up. No first responders were ever sent out for these calls because it didn't seem like an emergency. It just seemed like a confused elderly person. But no matter how many times they told her, she kept calling back and eventually her calls took a turn. Instead of calling 911 to ask for help with mundane tasks around the house, she would call 911 believing she was talking directly to her deceased husband, John. The dispatcher would pick up and the woman would say, John, where are you? John, John. By this time, the dispatchers had gotten so many calls from this woman, they would recognize her address coming through and they knew what to expect. They would answer the phone, they'd be respectful and they would tell her like they always did, this is 911, you can't call here, you need to talk to your family. And again, they did not send a responding unit out to her because it just seemed like she was confused, not in any danger. But one day when she called, she sounded frantic and scared. John, please come home, help me, I need help. John, come home. This time they would send first responders out to the woman's house. When the responding unit arrives at her house just minutes after she had placed the 911 call, they go to the door and they're knocking and they're yelling for her and she's not coming to the door and it's all quiet in the house. The door is unlocked, so they open it up and they announce themselves. They walk inside and immediately they can tell the heat is not on because it's very, very cold inside the house. They look around the first floor and they can't find her and there's no sign of a struggle or any obvious problems that could have happened inside of the house. So they go upstairs and they start searching all the rooms and no one's there until they get to the last room and it's the bedroom. They go inside and there's an older woman who's lying on the bed and she's clearly deceased and has been for several hours because rigor mortis had already set in. The police are able to confirm that the woman who's lying on the bed is the same woman who owns the house and lives there. And at this point, they call back to dispatch and they tell them, hey, you know, the woman that you claim made this 911 call, well, it can't have been her. Because based on rigor mortis, she was dead at the time that 911 call was made. But the dispatchers are like, no way. We know what she sounds like. We speak to her multiple times a week. We have a whole protocol built when we see her address come across because we speak to her so often. That 911 call that you got that led you to that house where she was, that call was made by her. What they ultimately decide is the reason for this discrepancy is she didn't have rigor mortis. She was just stiff because it was really cold inside of her house and that she had died in those couple of minutes between leaving the 911 call and when officers arrived. But in the back of everybody's minds, they're a little freaked out. A few days go by and another call is placed to 911 coming from that woman's home address. The dispatcher sees that and has to do a double take, like that's not possible. But they're thinking, okay, this could be a relative, it could be a friend, it could be anything. Picks up the phone and she's shocked when it's the same woman who is frantically yelling for John to come here, save me, help me, I need help. And the dispatcher who's well aware of the history and well aware that this woman's supposed to be dead, stays calm, goes through the procedure, tries to get more information from this woman, but the call ends abruptly and there's no more information to be had. And so not knowing what else to do, she asks a responding unit to go check this house out. The responding unit goes over to the property, they knock on the door, no one's inside, the door is actually still open, they go in, the house is empty, there's no one there, there's no one that could have made that call. At this point, dispatch is like, okay, 
this has got to be a prank. But the next day, same thing happens. Here comes a call from the dead woman's house. They pick it up and it's this distraught woman yelling for help. I need my husband. And the dispatcher is trying to get more information, but they can't. And then the line cuts out. Once again, they have to send responders to this location because this woman has called 911 and is saying that she needs help. And once again, the officers get to the house and it's vacant. Just like when she was alive, these calls would persist multiple times a week. They continued even after her house was broken into and burned to the ground. There's not even a house anymore. And there are still calls coming through from that address to 911. Finally, the police get in touch with the phone company and they explain the situation. And the phone company looks at their records and they say, actually, her phone line was disconnected almost immediately after she was deceased. But they tell police there's a chance that it might not have been disconnected properly at the site. And that could be a reason why it's still working. So they send a lineman to to go check out the actual property to confirm her lines were disconnected properly and that no wires were getting crossed. And he said, all of it checked out. Everything has been detached this whole time. The phone company thought perhaps there was a digital recording of her that got trapped in their system and was randomly bouncing to their call center. But the dispatchers would say, you know, it doesn't sound like a recording that's playing the same every single time. It's always the same message. She's yelling for her husband to come save her. But the way she sounds is always different. It's a unique phone call every single time. So because there wasn't a definitive explanation for why this was happening, they had to treat each call like it was serious. And so multiple times a week for a year, they received these ghost calls and had to send out responding officers to check on her. Even though the house was gone and there was nothing there and there was never anyone there. It was just a vacant lot. And then finally, a year after this woman has died, the calls just abruptly stopped. And the police did not launch an investigation into what it was because the reality is police need to prioritize things that are threats to people or places. And this really wasn't either of those things. It was just really bizarre. And so the official explanation for how a dead woman could be calling 911 from a non-existent phone line in a non-existent house for a year is, we don't know. The following stories all take place in the Twin Cities in Minnesota. On New Year's Eve 1980, 20-year-old Karen Potak was out at a bar with her friends celebrating, and at some point in the night, she slipped out because she didn't want to stay any later, and she began walking home. Now, she didn't have a jacket on, and it was very cold outside, and she's kind of stumbling through the streets, and a man sees her and pulls over and offers to give her a ride home. She's kind of intoxicated, and so she agrees to get in his car, and they drive off. A couple hours later, around 3 a.m., the police receive this phone call. Yes, please, this is an emergency. Please send a squad car to Pierce Butler Road, Malmberg Manufacturing Company Machine Shop. Please send an ambulance, too. There's a girl hurt there. Can you tell me what happened to her? Just hurry. She's laying on the ground in the back by the railroad tracks by the engine room. Hurry. What's the address? I don't know. Who are you? Using this information from the caller, the police arrive in the back of that building and they find Karen Potak. She had been repeatedly bludgeoned over the head with a tire iron and then left for dead. Miraculously, she would survive, but because of her head injury, she forgot almost everything about that night, including the description of the guy who picked her up and who probably attacked her and who probably was the one who called police. So the police try to interview some people in the area around where she was found, but it was a really deserted area and no one knew anything and there was no physical evidence left at the scene, so the case went cold. Then, five months later, the police receive another phone call. Oh, you find me? I just stabbed somebody with an ice pick. I can't stop myself. I keep killing somebody. Hello? Are you there? At this point, the police were not connecting this call with the call that immediately preceded finding Karen Potak, meaning they did not think that was the same person. And since in this call, there were no instructions on where to find this person, they didn't really have anything to go on, so they took note of it, but ultimately kind of disregarded it. But just a few hours later, a group of teenagers were walking through the forest when they found a dead body. The body belonged to 18-year-old Kimberly Compton, who had literally just moved to Minnesota. She graduated high school and decided she wanted to start fresh in Minnesota. She hopped on a bus, she goes to Minnesota, she gets off the bus, she goes into the first restaurant she sees, which is a diner, she sits down by herself, she's eating some food, and a man approaches her and says, hey, can I sit down with you? And so she lets him sit down and he asks, you know, who are you, what are you doing here? And she says, oh, you know, I just moved here. 
And this guy offers to drive her around town and show her the sights. And she's like, great. 15 minutes later, he would kill her with an ice pick. At this point, police are beginning to suspect that this person who keeps calling them immediately before they're finding women that have been attacked might be the same person. And two days after Compton was killed, they get another call that confirms this. Don't talk, just listen. I'm sorry what I did to Compton. I couldn't help it. Don't know why I had to stab her. I'm so upset about it. I keep getting drunk every night. I can't believe I did it. It's like a big dream. I can't think of being locked up. If I get locked up, I'll kill myself. I'd rather kill myself than get locked up. I'll try not to kill anybody else. From this point forward, they referred to this caller as the weepy voiced killer. And even though they had his voice recorded, they didn't have any physical evidence because he didn't leave any at the scene with Compton either. So they didn't have much to go on. The police would go to the diner and they would talk to the staff that was there and they would give a general description of the weepy voiced killer, but it wasn't enough to pinpoint a suspect. So once again, this case went cold too. Six months later, the police received yet another call. Please don't talk, just listen. I'm sorry I killed that girl. I stabbed her 40 times. Kimberly Compton was the first one over in St. Paul. I don't know what's the matter with me. I'm sick. I think I'm going to kill myself, I think. Where are you? I'm just going to. If somebody dies with a red shirt on, it's me. I've killed more people. I will never make it to Calm heaven. Calm down. Calm down. A day later, they find the body of 40-year-old Barbara Simons floating in the Mississippi River, tucked up against some brush. The night before, Barbara had been out at a bar and she had offered a cigarette to a man she hadn't met before. They began flirting and kind of hit it off. And at one point they were gonna to leave together. And before they left, Barbara turns to one of the waitresses and kind of jokingly says, boy, I hope he's nice cause I'm leaving with him. And the waitress for whatever reason had a really bad feeling about it and made a point of getting a really good look at the man she was leaving with. And that man of course would turn out to be the weepy voice killer. And as soon as he and Barbara left the bar, he would stab her to death and throw her in the Mississippi river. After the police began investigating this, they came to the bar and they they interviewed that waitress and she said, I got a really good look at this guy. And so the police show her 100 different mugshots of previously convicted felons in the area. And she immediately identifies 38 year old Paul Stefani and says, that's the guy. Paul had been convicted for aggravated assault and he also had a history of mental illness. Paul is immediately put under surveillance, but within 24 hours, he manages to ditch his tail and goes straight into downtown Minneapolis where he picks up 19 year old street worker, Denise Williams. Paul took her down a dark alleyway and she kind of sensed something was wrong. And so she grabbed a glass bottle that was sitting on the floor of the car. And when he went to attack her, she managed to hit him in the head and cut his face really, really badly. And she managed to protect herself enough that she could get out of the car and run away and save her own life. And a neighbor saw her running out of the car and kind of saw the whole exchange, didn't like how it looked, so they called 911. When police showed up, Paul was long gone. That same night, police get another call from the weepy voice killer, this one's a little bit different. He's actually asking for help for himself. I need an ambulance. Where? 1505 Westminster. 1505? Yes. Westminster, what's the problem? I'm all cut up. I got beat up. What's your apartment number? 208, I'm bleeding. 208, where are you bleeding from? From my arm, my face, my head. Now, by the time this call is being made, the audio recordings of his previous phone calls had been made public. They were aired on radio shows, on TV. People had heard his voice and it's fairly distinctive. And the dispatcher recognized his voice and told police, there's a chance the weepy voice killer just called us. So an ambulance comes and picks up Paul Stefani and brings him to the hospital. And when he's sitting in his hospital bed, police walk in and they apprehend him. He pled not guilty and prosecutors did not actually have that much evidence connecting him to each of these attacks. They had these audio recordings, but that was about it. And so ultimately he got 58 years in prison, not a life sentence. But considering his age, it wound up functioning like a life sentence. 12 years into that sentence, he was diagnosed with terminal cancer and was told he only had a year to live. And so it was at this point that he confessed to all of the attacks, including one they didn't know about. He murdered 33 year old Kathleen Greening in her own home. He just didn't make a phone call to police afterwards. Paul would die shortly after his confessions. So that's gonna do it guys. Let me know in the comments what you thought of these three stories and I will pin the best comment at the top of the comment section. If you enjoyed today's video and you haven't done this already, please invite the like button to your birthday party, but then give them the wrong address. Also please subscribe to our channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of our weekly uploads. If you wanna 
get in touch with me, you can direct message me on Instagram or on Twitter. My username for both platforms is the same. It's just John Ballin 416 I also have a ton of content over on TikTok where my username is Mr. Ballin. If you have a story suggestion, please submit it to our subreddit just called Mr. Ballin. It's linked in the description below. So whether I see you on Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, Reddit, YouTube, or some combination, just know that I really appreciate your support. And until next time, that's going to do it. See ya.